Gentlemen, it's Aaron Bulma here, uh, serving as military specialist for Carleton County. I'm going to give you another presentation tonight. This one is on Canada. Uh, now, to, particularly tonight, I'm going to focus on the First World War for Canada. And these are some of our Canadian troops with uh, um, number one Mark III Lee Enfield rifles, which is was our one of our stand, which was our standard rifle from 1916 onward. Um, so 1916 onward. Uh, after the Ross rifle proved ineffective. Now, certainly, um, Canada had certainly lost its a large number of troops in the First World War, uh, 67,000, and with uh, more thousands injured. Certainly, um, the Great War being one major um, effect of, of Canada becoming a country in itself. So, the military history of Canada during the First World War, of course, began in, on August 4, 1914, when Britain entered the First World War. And, uh, and of course, this war lasted from 1914 to 1918. By declaring war on Germany, the British declaration of war automatically brought Canada into the war because of Canada's legal status as a British dominion, which left foreign policy decisions in the hands of the UK government. However, the Canadian government had the freedom to determine the, the country's level of involvement in the war. On the August 5, 1914, the Governor General declared a war between Canada and Germany. Uh, the militia was not mobilized and instead an independent Canadian expeditionary force was raised. And one of, you know, there were numbers of them, the 55th uh, CEF, the 26th uh, Infantry, uh, 20, 26 Infantry, so the 20, uh, 26th Battalion it was an amalgamation of the 67th Carlton Light Infantry in Carlton County and the 71st York, um, and among other things, uh, the Hussars of St. John, and uh, so uh, they had a number of units in there that amalgamated into the 26th Battalion Canadian Expeditionary Force. Um, I just actually got some medals. Uh, from a corporal, uh, who was it, Kimball, of 26th Battalion yesterday from, for my museum. Um, so there's all kinds of history, local history, coming from uh, the Canadian Light Infantry, or sorry, the Carlton Light Infantry, 6th uh, 7th Carlton Light Infantry, and then of course it, it amalgamated eventually after the First World War became the Carlton York Regiment in the 30s. Um, Canada's sacrifices and contributions to the war changed its history and enabled it to become more independent while opening a deep rift between the French and English-speaking populations. For the first time in its history, Canadian forces fought as a distinct unit, first under a British co commander, but ultimately under a Canadian-born commander. The highlights of Canadian military achievement during the First World War came during the Somme, Vimy and Passchendaele battles. Uh, those battles were amazing. I mean, the Somme lost over a million men. I mean, and that some of these wars would last months. And of course, um, after the march in Paris was brought to a halt, I mean, a lot of the the, the with the in France, and German troops, and French troops were uh, and and Canadian troops um, British Canadian and French troops were um, in the war of attrition in trenches and that changed little until 1917 right um, with the change of technology technology certainly so much improved in the first world war and then these battles uh, it showed and what later became known as Canada's 100 days so Canada's total casualties stood at the end of the war at 67,000 killed and 250,000 wounded out of an expeditionary force at 620,000 personnel and people mobilized. 39% of mobilized were casualties. The July Crisis, a series of interrelated diplomatic and military escalations among the major powers of Europe in the summer of 1914 led to the outbreak of the First World War. The crisis began on, on June 28, 1914, when um, Gavrero uh, uh, Princip, a Bosnian Serb, assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir uh, presumptive 
to the Austro-Hungarian throne. A complex web of alliances coupled, um, coupled with miscalculations when many leaders regarded war as in their best interest or felt that a general war would not occur um, resulted in a general outbreak of hostilities among most major European nations in early 1914. Austro-Hungary uh, viewed the uh, Eredentist uh, movements of South Slavs as promoted by Serbia as a threat to the unity of its multinational empire. Followed at the, following the assassination, Austria sought to inflict a, ma a military blow on Serbia to demonstrate its own strength and to dampen Serbian support for Yugoslav nationalism. However, Vienna, wary of the reaction of the Russian Empire, a major supporter of Serbia, of course, sought a guarantee um, from its ally Germany that Berlin would support Austria in any conflict. Germany guaranteed its support but urged Austria to attack quickly. While world sympathy for Ferdinand was high in order to localize the war and to avoid drawing in Russia. Some German leaders believed that growing Russian economic power would change the balance of power between the two nations, that a war was inevitable, and that Germany would be better off if a war happened soon. However, rather than launching a quick attack with available military forces, Austrian leaders uh, deliberated uh, into mid-July uh, before deciding that Austria would uh, give Serbia a harsh ultimatum on July 23rd and would not attack without a full mobilization of the Austro-Hungarian army, which could not be accomplished before 25th of July 1914. Just prior to the Serbian reply to the ultimatum, Russia decided that it would intervene in any in Austro-Serbian war and ordered a partial mobilization of its armed forces. While well, Russian military leadership acknowledged that Russia was not yet strong enough for a general war, Russia believed that the Austri Austrian grievance against Serbia was a pretext orchestrated by Germany and that St. Petersburg needed a show of, uh, to show strength in support of its Serbian client. The Russian uh, partial mobilization, the first major military action not undertaken by a direct participant in the conflict between Austria-Hungary and Serbia, increased the willingness of Serbia to defy the threat of an Austrian attack and greatly increased the alarm in Germany about masses of Russian troops assembling near its borders. Previously, the German uh, general staff had predicted that Russian mobilization in the East would be slower than that of French, um, Russia's French ally on Germany's western border. Therefore, the German military strategy in any conflict with Russia involved attacking France through Belgium. <clears throat> so, um, to avoid French fixed defenses, of course, and uh, certainly uh, similar to certain circumstances in the Second World War, um, and quickly defeating France in the West before turning to face Russia in the East. France, aware that it would have to act together with its Russian ally to defeat its German rival, escalated its military preparations as tensions along the Russian border increased, which in turn further alarmed Germany. Britain, however, decided um, that it had a moral obligation to defend Belgium and its and to aid its formal um, allies. Uh, sorry, yeah. Well, Great Britain was semi uh, formally aligned with Russia and France. It also had relatively friendly diplomatic relations with Germany, and many British leaders saw no compelling reason to involve Britain in a conventional war. Britain repeatedly offered to mediate using the Serbian reply as the basis of negotiation, and Germany made various promises in an attempt to ensure British neutrality. However, Britain decided that it had a moral obligation to defend Belgium and to aid its, its former, al former allies, and thus 
became the last major country actively involved in the July crisis to formally enter the conflict on the 4th of August. And of course, we entered on this, the 5th of August, being a dominion of England. Um, by, early, by early August, the ostensible reason for armed conflict, the dispute between Serbia and Austria-Hungary over the murdered hair, had already become a side note to a general European war. Of course, the First World War um, for Canada was, for Canada, the bloodiest conflict in Canadian history, taking the lives of nearly, oh, well, some say 61,000, uh, some reports say 67,000, around 67, 68,000. It erased romantic notions of war, introducing slaughter on a massive scale, and instilled a fear of foreign military involvement that would last until the Second World War. Of course, the great achievements of Canadian soldiers on battlefields such as Ypres, Vimy and Passchendaele have, however, ignited a sense of national pride and a confidence that Canada could stand on its own, apart from the British Empire, on the world stage. The world, uh, the war also deepened the divide between French and English Canada, so and marked the beginning of uh, widespread state intervention in society and the economy. Of course, so um, the Triple Entente, which is our side, and eventually America, 1917, um, Great Britain, France, and Russia. So uh, the Russian Empire under the Tsar, the French, and of course the British. Of course, for the German Empire, of course, you have Kaiser Wilhelm, um, the German Empire. Imperial Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy for the Triple Alliance. And that's the World War I alliance. This is 1914. So during the, the Second Boer War, um, this is talking about the Ross Rifle, a minor diplomatic fight broke out between Canada and the United Kingdom after they later uh, refused to license the Lee Enfield SMLE, the small uh, magazine Lee Enfield design for production in Canada. So the small magazine Lee Enfield, um, the uh, number one Mark II, number one Mark III, and eventually number one Mark IV in the Second World War. So Sir Charles Ross offered um, to finance the construction of a fact factory in Canada to produce his newly designed straight pole rifle for Canadian service. So this offer was accepted by the Liberal government of Sir Wilfrid Laurier, and Ross was awarded his first contract in 1903 for 12,000 Mark I Ross rifles. It generally, it is generally accepted that Ross's design was inspired by the straight pole Austrian Menlincher 1895 rifle introduced into Austria-Hungarian service in the 1890s and used throughout World War I and as, and as secondary weapons into the, the Second World War. Um, Ross's earliest rifles unmistakably borrowed a number of mechanical details directly from the Manlicher, which was a relatively new design at the time Ross was producing his first rifles in the late 1890s. I built one of these models before. It's actually in the Gagetown Museum. Um, Ross certainly had its problems, and that's why it was withdrawn from service. So here's uh, more of the Ross. Mark II, Mark III, I'm not sure of this one. So the first 1,000 rifles were given to the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. That would, would eventually become the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, <clears throat> so, and that was for testing. Routine inspection before operational testing found 113 defects bad enough to warrant rejection. One of these was a poorly designed bolt lock that enabled the bolt to fall right out of the rifle. Another was poorly uh, tempered component springs that were um, described as being as soft as copper. In 1906, the, um, the Northwest Mounted Police reverted to their model 1894 Winchesters and Lee Medfords. So, um, mechanism comparison between a Ross Mark III and a 1910 Mark II. 
1907, um, which is, I actually have a bayonet of uh, First World War from, uh, I believe it's from, it's a 1907, so it would be Mark II. Um, I believe the shortcomings, so the shortcomings of the rifle were made apparent before the Second Battle of Ypres, Ypres in April 1915. Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry was the first unit to voice its objections about the rifle. The regiment replaced the Ross rifle with the more familiar and rugged Lee Enfield and later uh, persuaded the 3rd Division to switch to the Lee Enfield. The rifles showed poor tolerance of dirt when used in field conditions, particularly uh, screw um, threads operating uh, the bolt lugs. So um, jamming the weapon open or closed. So and that was not good, certainly in uh, the heat of combat. It also had problems with British-made ammunition. And when, of course, when that was used, um, which was certainly obviously quite often, um, which was produced with lower tolerances than Canadian made one. So another part of the jamming problem came from the bolt's outer face hitting uh, the bolt stop, then deforming the thread shape. So these are all problems and this is certainly the bolt um, <clears throat> jamming in, in a small amount of mud, which is so much mud in the, in the trenches and mud, uh, rain, snow, sleet, what you see here is a Mark III. Sorry, um, it's late. <laughs> I haven't, um, yeah, I haven't looked at one of these in a while. Um, so this is the Mark III Ross rifle. Yeah, I believe it, here's the same Mark II, Mark III, I believe. Canadian Prime Minister Sir uh, Robert Borden, this is with the First Ward of the British Admiralty, Sir Winston Churchill. Of course, that's our Prime Minister at the time. Here's Sir Robert Borden himself. Um, and so, of course, he was under pressure to, to ramp, ramp up production, uh, rifles, everything, uh, machinery, machinery, ammunition, artillery, um, and Canada, roughly about 8 million people. Um, eight to nine million people uh, at the time we certainly needed to produce more uh, but we were certainly a small country so actually looking up that that's actually so a little bit so roughly about 7.95 million wow so war in the economy at the first uh, war um, at the first part of it war uh, hurt a troubled economy increasing unemployment and making it hard for Canada's new debt-ridden um, transcontinental railways, the Canadian uh, Northern and the Grand Trunk uh, Pacific. Uh, and that made them, of course, uh, made them harder to find credit, certainly. Um, by 1915, however, the military spending equaled the entire government expenditure of 1913. Um, Minister of Finance uh, Thomas White opposed raising taxes since um, Britain could not afford to lend to Canada. White turned to the United States, also despite the the belief that Canadians would never lend to their uh, to their own government. White had to take the risk. In 1915, he asked for 50 million. He got 100 million. In 1917, the government's Victory loan campaign began raising huge sums from the ordinary citizens for the first time. <clears throat> Canada's war effort was financed mainly by borrowing. Between 1913 and 1918, the national debt rose from 463 million to 2.46 billion. So this is one of the World War One posters. Uh, this is your flag. It stands for liberty. Fight for it. Join. This is the. Course, Canadian Expeditionary Force and uh, um, going to 207th. That's, of course, another uh, unit um, <clears throat> in, I believe, uh, I can't tell. In Ottawa. Yeah, that's Ottawa. So, the First World War statistics certainly um, 
And so this is an older presentation that I've modernized over time. I've used it in schools and whatnot, and I've modernized it over time. And yeah, um, so the start, 4th of August, 1914, and of course, uh, November the 11th, 1918. So we Canadians, we had uh, men and women, we had 630,000 that served and 425,000 that went overseas. Uh, again, another statistic says that over 60,000 killed. Um, high estimate 67,000, um, up to 250,000 wounded. But that that's another there. Um, major battles of Canadian involvement, of course. Yeah, 26 battalion was involved in in uh, any kind of different, um, many different battles from Hill 70, uh, Eep, uh They were involved in you know, in the Vimy Ridge. Um, so the second battle of Ypres, uh, 1915, uh, so Eloy, um, 1916, Mount Sorrow, 1916, Somme, 1916, Vimy Ridge, 1917, Hill 70, Passchendaele, 1917, and Amiens in 1918. Um, so, um, recruitment at home, unemployment, Unemployed workers flocked to enlist in 1914-1915, recruiting handled uh, by pre-war militia regiments that by civic organizations cost the government nothing. By the end of 1914, the target for the Canadian Expeditionary Force was uh, 50,000. By summer 1915, uh, it was 150,000. During the visit to England that summer, Prime Minister Borden was shocked with the magnitude of the struggle. To demonstrate Canadian commitment to the war effort, Borden used the 19, his 1916 uh, New Year's message to plead to pledge 500,000 soldiers from the Canadian population of barely 8 million. Amazing. Um, by then, volunteering had virtually run dry. Early uh, contingents had been filled by recent British immigrants. Um, en enlistments in 1915 uh, had taken most of the Canadian born who were willing to go. So the total 330,000 was impressive, but of course insufficient time. And here's another propaganda poster, um, enlistment poster. Give to the Canadian Patriotic Fund, and this is the raising money uh, for the fund for fighting overseas for the Canadian government. So I have one of these. This is the Canadian Red Ensign used from 1868, a year after our country was created in 1867 to 1921. We use this, this. So this is our First World War Red Ensign. I actually, I have one of these. I got one a, about a month and a half ago um, for the museum. And I've still got to build a Ross Mark II and Mark III for the museum. I'm going to do that soon. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have the designs. I just haven't looked at them in a while, and um, so I want to build some of those soon, sometime. Um, <clears throat> so here is what you see here is 67th Carlton Light Infantry. That's in Carlton County. So Carlton Light Infantry. Uh, these are very rare finds. If you can find them. Uh, goodness, um, they're very, very difficult to find. Uh, certainly, um, I have a Carlton Light Infantry jacket um, or uh, tunic um, that is uh, I have from um, our Carlton Light Infantry um, in Woodstock, and it's part of my museum, uh, one of my prized possessions, uh, prized pieces. Um, I have a lot of um, a lot of data on some of the stuff, and but um, it much of this stuff, of course, is hard to find. Um, <clears throat> this is the cat badge of the Carlton Light Infantry, right here in Carlton County. So this is the Carlton Light Infantry Band. This is actually in the 1930s. Um, and that's by the cat badge. Um, so, um, just a bit of history going through the, um, <clears throat> well, from the Carlton Light Infantry up through um, 
to the Carlton York and then what it is now is RNBR. So the Royal New Brunswick Regiment, of course, is a reserve infantry regiment of the Canadian Army, and that's based uh, right in Fredericton. It's not right on Gagetown. I was actually there uh, this fall. Um, so, and I presented a Bren gun carrier model to the unit for the 250th anniversary. Quite an honor. It's a great honor. Great honor. Um, it certainly wasn't as, they couldn't do it as big as what they wanted because, of course, the pandemic. And uh, it, that certainly has taken a toll on all of us. Um, so this is, of course, uh, the Royal New Brunswick Regiment, of course, is part of 37th Canadian Brigade Group, um, the 5th Canadian Division. Of course, from 1954-2012, it consisted of the two battalions, but in 2012, the 2nd Battalion was reorganized as um, a distinct uh, regiment, the North Shore Regiment. So, yeah, that was, of course, the two battalions, and so then it became, of course, the North Shore Regiment. Um, <clears throat> And that split off. And North Shore, of course, uh, the North Shore Regiment is known for go for being going on D-Day um, in the Second World War. It's part of the Third Division, uh, Third Canadian Division, in landing on on uh, Juno Beach. And uh, so, the Royal New Brunswick Regiment, of course, holds fifth, 65 battle honors, and of course, formed on 10th of September 1869 in Woodstock, New Brunswick as the Carlton Light Infantry, redesignated November 5th, 1969 as the 67th Carlton Light Infantry, and of course redesignated May 8th, 1900 as the 67th Regiment Carlton Light Infantry, redesignated in 15th of March, 1920 as the Carlton Light Infantry, and amalgamated in 15th of December, 1936 with the York Regiment and renamed the Carlton and New York Regiment. Redesignated, and I have a bunch of stuff on the Carlton New York Regiment. They are a, a feature of, of my museum. And uh, so the Carlton New York Regiment uh, fought in Italy, in Sicily and Italy, um, and then again in, in Holland. And, uh, and so they were in numerous places in the Second World War as well as uh, course um, unit being part of the 26th battalion in the first world war um redesignated uh 7th of november 1940 as the second reserve battalion the carlton new york regiment 1940 redesignated november 1st 1945 as the carlton in new york regiment and amalgamated on october 31st 1954 the regiment uh the new brunswick scottish and redesignated the first battalion, the New the New Brunswick Regiment, Carlton and York. So <clears throat> they've renamed it so many times. And of course, 18th May 1956 Regiment does it redesignated as the Royal New Brunswick Regiment. <clears throat> and what it is today, it was a while ago it was the first Royal New Brunswick Regiment. Now it's just Royal New Brunswick Regiment. Spem Reduxit, meaning hope restored. So that's what Spem Reduxit means. Uh, and of course, that's uh, that's its motto. And uh, every regiment's got a motto. So, <clears throat> so this is this what I this is just a closer up of what I have just explained. So the details of the 67th Regiment of St. John Fu uh, Fusiliers, uh, Fusiliers, the 67th Carlton Light Infantry, 67th Carlton Light Infantry, 71st York Regiment, and 74th Regiment, the New Brunswick Rangers, um, were placed on active service on the 6th of August, 1914, the day after the war, for local protective duty. So, and then, of course, the these units, um, part of the amalgamation of the 26th Battalion. 26th Battalion, New Brunswick CEF, was authorized on 7th of November 1914 and embarked for Britain on June 15th, 1915. There's pictures of that I've got on here. It arrived in France on 16th September 19, 1915. 
where it fought as part of the 5th Infantry Brigade, 2nd Canadian Division in France and Flanders throughout the war. The battalion was disbanded, of course, on 30th of August, 1920. The 55th Battalion, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, uh, CEF, was authorized on 7th of November, 1914, and embarked for Britain on 30th of October, 1915, where it provided reinforcements for the Canadian Corps in the field until 6th of July, 1916, when its personnel were absorbed by the 40th uh, Battalion, um, Nova Scotia uh, Canadian Expeditionary Force. The battalion was disbanded on the um, 20th, first may 1917 so the 104th uh which is another local area regiment um but another battalion meaning was authorized on 22nd december 1915 and embarked for britain on Ju on the 28th of june 1916 where it provided reinforcements for the canadian corps in the field until 24th january 1917 when its personnel were absorbed by the 104th the 105th Battalion, Prince Edward Island. So these are all units like in New Brunswick uh, and in Newfoundland and, and local units, you know. Um, so the 115th Battalion, uh, New Brunswick, was authorized on 22nd of December 1915 and embarked for Britain on 23rd of July 1916, where it provided the reinforcements for the Canadian Corps in the field until. 21st of October 1916, when his personnel were absorbed by the 112th Battalion, Nova Scotia, uh, CEF. The battalion, of course, was disbanded on 1st of September 1917 because it was um, absorbed. Um, <clears throat> the 140th Battalion, St. John's uh, Tiger, CEF, was authorized on the 22nd December 1915 and embarked for Britain on the 25th September 1916 where on um, November 1916 its personnel were absorbed by the the depots of the Royal Canadian Regiment CEF and Princess Patricia's Canadian Light, uh, Light Infantry and so the uh, PPCLI um, and to provide reinforcements for the Canadian Corps in the field. The battalion was disbanded on 27th of July, 1918. The 145th Battalion, New Brunswick Canadian Expeditionary Force was authorized on 22nd of December, uh, 1915, and embarked for Britain on September um, 15, uh, sorry, the 25th of September 1916, where on the 7th of October 1916, its personnel were absorbed by the 9th Reserve Battalion, CEF, to provide reinforcements for the Canadian Corps in the field. The battalion was disbanded on the 17th of July 1917. The 236th uh, Battalion, NB, so the NB uh, Kilties, the NB Kilties, <clears throat> New Brunswick Kilties CEF was authorized uh, on 15th of July 1916 and embarked for Britain on 30th October and 9th November 1917, where it provided reinforcements for the Canadian Corps in the field until 13th of March 1918, when its personnel were absorbed by the 20th Reserve Battalion CEF. The battalion was disbanded on 30th of August. 1920. So see here, you see here the uh, 67th Militia, um, Carlton Light Infantry, 67th. The this is this the York Regiment. This is the uh, York Regiment, the 71st York Regiment. Uh, cat badge. These are cat badges here, and then the 67th. Uh, sorry, the 62nd, and the 62nd Regiment. That is the Saint John uh, Fusiliers. That's in Saint John. These are all local units. The York Regiment, of course, formed on September 10th, uh, 19, 1869, as the York Provisional Volunteer Battalion, redesignated the 12th November 1869. Um, they 
course, redesignated as the 71st York Volunteer Battalion, redesignated uh, 8th of May 19, uh, 1900 as the 71st York Regiment, redesignated 15th of March 1920 as the York Regiment, amalgamated um, 15th December 1936 with the Carlton Light Infantry to become the Carlton York Regiment. So the Carlton York Regiment was formed in 1937 by the amalgamation of two New Brunswick regiments. Now I'm getting into some just some of the local history of uh, these regiments and then uh, which connects with the Second World War as well. Um, by the amalgamation of the two New Brunswick regiments, the Carlton Light Infantry and the York Regiment, the Carlton Light Infant the Carlton York Regiment traces its origins back through the 67th uh, Battalion Carlton Light Infantry and the 71st York Battalion of Infantry to the various local regiments and companies raised for the defense of the province of New Brunswick. When the Loyalists arrived in 1783, many of the men had served in the provisional provincial regiments raised in America. For the safety of the settlements, land was granted by grouping settlers as rare as, as possible by um, regiments themselves. And this plan, although modified considerably, was the beginning of the militia in New Brunswick. The 71st Battalion evolved from the York County militia, consisting of three battalions. The 1st Battalion with headquarters at Fredson, raised in 1787, the second battalion raised later at Kingsclear, and the third battalion in 1822 at Douglas. <clears throat> the 67th battalion came from the Carlton County, from of course the Carlton County area, Carlton County Militia, a regiment of two battalions, the first organized at Woodstock in 1834, and the second in the same year uh, at Wicklow. Training in those days consisted of drills at local centers, and from time to time the militia was called up on active service due to a, the unsettled state of the main New Brunswick boundary dispute later during the uh, Finian raids. Of course, these are the Finian raids we're talking about. Um, an 1863 report of the inspecting officer noted that the two companies of the York Regiment at Fredton um, were the best in the province, and the company of the Carlton Regiment in Woodstock was extremely efficient. The York Regiment uh, perp uh, perpetuated the 12th and the 140th uh, Canadian Infantry Battalions and the Carlton Light Infantry, um, the four, of course, the 44th and the 104th Battalions. Canadian Expeditionary Force, in, and that was in, uh, of course, the First World War, 1914-1918. Uh, the regiment is now affiliated with the Queen's own Royal West Kent Regiment and the East Yorkshire Regiment. The principal features of those of whose badges are incorporated in the badge of the Carlton and York Regiment. Um, the White Horse of Kent superimposed on the Star of New Brunswick. So the 26th Battalion, and I have one of these, um, it's um, the great piece to have of our history. The 26th Battalion, New Brunswick Canadian Expeditionary Force, was of course an infantry battalion uh, in the First World War, as I've explained. So the battalion was authorized on the of course, 7th of, of November 1914 and, and embarked for Britain on, on the June 15th of the next year, right? So it embarked for in France on... Um, 16th of September, where it fought as part of the 5th Infantry Brigade, 2nd Canadian Division in France and then Flanders until the end of the war. Of course, uh, so the 26th, and that was the span on the August 30th, 1920, this 26th Battalion recruited throughout New Brunswick and was mobilized at St. John. So the famed Fighting 26th, now there, there's books about it, and I, I mean to get some more books about it, the 26th participated in all of the major battles in which Canadian Corps were involved. Mount Sorrel, the Somme, so 1916, 1918, um, Fleurs de Corselet, uh, uh, Thibfell, uh, Incur uh, Heights, 
Errors, uh, Bible Errors, 1917, 1918. Vimy, 1917. Arlet, Scarp, um, 1917, 1918. Hill, 70. Ypres, 1917. Passchendaele, Evans. Hindenburg Line, Canal de, Lo Canal de Nord, Cambrai, in 1918. Two, two Mons, so the Mons, Battle Mons. And then, of course, the bat battalion being expanded. 20. The 26 is continued today by the Royal New Brunswick Regiment, of course, and <clears throat> you can find a lot of different stuff online, books, uh, and reading its secret war diaries, where it, um, you can, the books are more sometimes more expensive, but um, so they begin in November 1914 and end in May 1919 and give a fascinating glimpse into the life of the battalion at war. And so this, these are, so this here is what you'd see on the, uh, the patches of the uniforms of 26th Battalion. So these are three majors of the 26th Battalion uh, before embarking, embarkation in St. John. Uh, I'm not sure the names of these ones, but these are three members of uh, the 26th before they head out on June 15th. And so th these are scenes of the regiment forming up uh, the embarkation. And so this is the embarkation and ammunition column in June 13th, 1915. So they're getting ready. Five officers of the 26th Battalion in St. John. Some of the 26th, so this is in the paper. These are paper articles here. And this is them leaving. This is I know that that's a bit blurry, but that's them leaving on the on uh, the 15th. Officers and men of the 26th, and that's uh, them with the Ross rifles, uh, Mark threes on their way part of embarkation uh, from St. John and that's in 1915. This is the welcome home banner of the uh, 26th Battalion. Um, so of course <clears throat> the war dead of the Canadian Expeditionary Force uh, they say so here's another figure, 60,661, or 9.28% of the, of the <clears throat> over 600,000 that enlisted. There's numerous um, figures that come out for numbers, but it's definitely way over 60. Uh, it's, it's definitely over 60,000, and over, definitely way over uh, 600,000 who enlisted. And, uh, and that's the dead of, the percentage of dead wounded in uh, so wounded and and dead make up about what I say over 30 percent of the expeditionary force across Canada um, so here's more of our um, our men in Europe preparing to embark in battle fixing bayonets over the line Canadians uh, you can see here you've got uh, the Mark I uh, or Mark II Brody helmets, and then with the uh, original, so you've got your your uniforms, your the webbing sets. A lot of times, what they will use are PO8 webbing sets, uh, and of course uh, the PO8 webbing sets, your canteen, your your, and of course your number one Mark III Lee Enfield rifle. So the PO8 webbing uh, pattern web set was, uh, and I've got some of these um, from my museum, I need to get more, but it was the main equipment from which the British and Imperial armies fought the First World War. The inability of the Mills factory to keep up with the demand led to the introduction of a, a leather version, the 1914 pattern leather equipment, which was intended for training and second line troops but often found its way into the front lines. Um, 20 years after the end of the conflict, the PO8 webbing was replaced by the 1937, the P37 
pattern web equipment and uh, so <clears throat> however the massive expansion of the British in Commonwealth armed forces immediately before the, and after the outbreak of the Second World War meant that the POA weapon continued in frontline use up through even in the Second World War I have a number of the uh, canteens um, yeah they're great uh, pieces of en enamel canteens they have so the Battle of the Somme, I'll, I'll cover a little bit of about the Battle of the Somme. Um, it's uh, in one presentation, it's a lot, it'd be too much to, to cover every battle, but I will cover as much uh, some of the Somme and some of Vimy Ridge. I, I've done one presentation on Vimy Ridge before. Um, so a few words um, conjure the futility and the staggering losses of the First World War like the Somme. In the summer of 1916, the British launched a major offensive against German lines. The battle lasted five months, killed or wounded approximately 1.2 million men, and produced little gains. So, <clears throat> the Canadian Corps uh, was only involved in the final three months of the fighting. So it was largely, you know, the French and British. Um, however, on the offensive's first day, the Royal Newfoundland Regiment was nearly annihilated at Beaumont Hamel. And um, many, many men died marching through up to enemy lines. Many men died on July 1st, on exactly that, uh, the first day. <clears throat> So Hill 70, a badly, so this is a, a badly wounded Canadian soldier drinking hot coffee at a soup kitchen a hundred yards from the German lines amid the push on Hill 70. So these are just boys, you know, some of them a lot about their age, 16 years old, baby faced, 17, 18 years old. Men from around here, kids from around here, and you know, kids from here, Woodstock, all the way across Canada. The capture of Hill 70 in France was an important Canadian victory during the First World War and the first major action fought by the Canadian Corps under a Canadian commander. The battle in August 1917 gave the Allied forces a crucial strategic position overlooking the, the occupied city of Lens. And so this is, of course, uh, 1917, in the summer of 1917, the war was not going well for the Allies. And, of course, Russia was wavering on the Eastern Front as the country began to be rocked by revolution, of course. And that's the Russian Revolution where the Bolsheviks, Bolsheviks take over and, then, and Russia becomes the Soviet Union. Um, while the French army was weakened by widespread mutinies uh, over the situation there. Uh, the German U-boat campaign at sea was uh, straggling the vital flow of supplies that allowed Britain to continue fighting, uh, just as it had, just as it was. Um, what I've talked about in the Second World War, this started in the First World War. Um, the United States had recently entered the war, but would need time to prepare its troops uh, for battle. Months, months. The major Allied offensive at Pasno was bogging down in the mud in, uh, of Belgium. And against the cha this challenging backdrop, the Canadian Corps was called into action. And of course, Hill 70, uh, our country's greatest victory at Vimy Ridge in April 1917, was soon followed by Lieutenant General Arthur Curry, who had played an important role in planning and directing the battle there. Um, being named commander of the Canadian Corps, its major action under his leadership would come in France at Hill 70 and Lens, where British High Commander Field Marshal Douglas Haig ordered the Canadians to attack um, to force the Germans to divert troops away from the heavy fighting uh, further north around Passchendaele. Curry was initially directed to assault only Lens, a coal mining town a few kilometers north of Vimy Ridge. The war had largely reduced Lens to a blasted maze of ruined buildings which was studded with strong enemy defensive positions. 
after surveying the situation. Uh, though Curry felt that his artillery would have trouble smashing the well camouflaged German defenses there, and a direct attempt to sending attacking troops into the town would result in troubled and terrible casualties. And here's Canadian wounded uh, living dressing station. He persuaded his superiors to instead allow the Canadians to first capture the nearby high ground to the north, codenamed Hill 70, because it rose 70 meters above sea level. Curry's clever plan was to take its slopes with a surprise assault, then quickly set up the Canadian defenses to cut down the inevitable counterattacks that the Germans would launch as the enemy could never allow the strategically located hill to remain in Allied hands. The Canadians carefully prepared in advance of this operation, and our soldiers trained extensively. Allied artillery softened uh, up the German positions in the area, and trench raids were conducted south of Lens to mislead the enemy on where the, the main attack would come. On August 15, 1917, the offensive was launched, and the Canadians soon seized most of the objectives of the hope of on the slopes of Hill 70. The shocked Germans reacted as expected and flung a total of, set of 21 counterattacks against our soldiers over the days that followed. The result was carnage as they advanced again and again into the deadly hails of bullets from 250 Canadian machine guns uh, and were pounded by heavy artillery. <clears throat> 21 counterattacks. Wow. <clears throat> the fighting at Hill 70 was remarkably brutal to even the most battle hardened soldiers. Poison gas was widely used, often forcing the men to gasp for air inside their restrictive respirators as they struggled to see the advancing uh, enemy through their fogged up goggles. Many of our soldiers had to engage in desperate hand to hand combat against the tenacious German attackers who managed to reach the Canadian defensive lines. Despite the Germans' ferocious efforts, Hill 70 remained in the Canadian grasp. The Canadians, uh, the, sorry, the Germans still held lens, however, although it was now being swept by fire from our forces holding the commanding heights of the north. On August 21st and 23rd, it was the Canadians' turn to again go on the offensive as they launched attacks on the town itself. It would also prove to be their turn their turn to suffer major casualties as the Germans the German defenders poured heavy fire of their own on the exposed Canadian attackers. After managing to capture the western portion of Lens, the Canadian attacks petered out in the face of stiff resistance and the battle of Hill 70 came to an end by August 25th, despite failing to achieve all of its goals. It was a remo remarkable success for the Canadian Corps. Sacrifice, of course, you know, the First World War was a particular bloody conflict, even and even relatively successful attacks took a devastating toll. The fighting at Hill 70 in Lens was no exception, and the hundreds thousand strong Canadian Corps suffered some 9,200 casualties between August 15th and the 25th of 1917. The Germans were hit even harder, with as many as 25,000 of their soldiers being killed, wounded, or taken prisoner during this period. So that is part of the, uh, you know, that's just a small portion of the you know, 67,000 some that died in this conflict and of over the, the 650,000 men and women who served in, in uniform in the First World War for Canada. Here's a grave of Canadian, what was no man's land. So, so Arthur Curry takes command. Lieutenant General Arthur Curry took command of the Canadian Corps. Uh, in June 1917, following the Corps' um, victory at Vimy Ridge, replacing, and that's replacing British General Julian Bung. And Julian Bung 
was uh, Bung of Vimy, Vincent Bung of Vimy. Um, Curry was the first Canadian to put in charge of um, of the Corps, Canada's main fighting forces on the Western Front. So, and of course, um, finally Arthur Curry takes command after Julian Bung is, uh, and of course, uh, being replaced. Um, in July, Curry received orders from Douglas Haig, commander-in-chief of all British-led forces in Western Europe, to capture the French coal mining city of Lens. And so that was, of course, this is all the stuff leading around Passchendaele. Haig hoped uh, this action would divert German attention and military resources away from the, from the major Allied offensive then raging at Passchendaele in Belgium. The fight up for Hill 70 was a large scale and shockingly grisly battle. So here's just a map of some of our major battles like uh, Cambry, Vimy Ridge, of course, Beaumont Hamel, where uh, the Newfoundland Regiment was just about wiped out uh, in July 1st, 1916. Here's Hill 70, Mont Sorrel, Mons, Ypres, Passchendaele, and saint Ory. And there's Brussels, that's the capital of Belgium. Um, <clears throat> so the, this is so to show you how slow, of course, uh, First World War uh, moves compared to the Second World War. Um, mechanization, of course, even though mechanization certainly a lot of technology and weapons were created and strategies during the First World War. The first tanks, the first aircraft were used. First fighters, biplane fighters, um, which they had to synchronize the prop blades so that the machine guns would not shoot off the props. Um, they, um, on certain designs, uh, the F1 Camel, you know, and uh, these are some of the designs. Um, the Sopwith, British Sop, um, British Sopwith F1 Camel design. It's one example of modern, you know, of the First World War fighters. Um, the Mark I tanks, the Mark I male, Mark I female, came out in uh, 1916 at the end of the Battle of the Somme. German submarines, that for the first time ever, were used uh, to a massive extent. Uh, submarine warfare, first time ever. Air warfare, our heavy artillery was never used to this extent before. And these commanders all thought that, you know, with the mechanization of warfare, it will save lives. Quite the contrary. It took more lives than ever. It was industrializing warfare, of course. Um, <clears throat> gas. Of course, you cannot forget gas. Um, we'll t I'll talk, um, you know, in this presentation about a little bit about the gas. Uh, yeah. And uh, blister agent. Chlorine gas mustard gas and phosphine phosphine being the deadliest i think um first time ever it being used on a massive scale like this in any conflict um yeah so um front lines the blue 1917 or sorry 1914 um and then of course you can see the front line in july see where it stands um, in July 1918 and of course the front line in November 1918 how far they pushed them back and in, in from in this this war of attrition you know you take a, a kilometer the enemy takes it a kilometer back and in a number of days or weeks depending on the battle you take a half kilometer they take it back in the mud rain sleet and snow um, horrible cold weather and uh, and this changed little until 1917, uh, this war of attrition. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the 65th. I'm going to talk some about of our local artillery, 65th battery. Uh, that's the siege battery in Woodstock, the Canadian field battery. Organized in March 1916 as a draft given a uh, deeper battery under the command of Captain J. H. Evans. Authorized authorization published in General Order 69 of uh, 15th July 1916. Mobilized at Woodstock 
and New Brunswick and stationed there until the spring of 1918, recruited, of course, in New Brunswick. Demobilized at Padawawa in uh, October 1918, personnel were dispersed to number one tank battalion, number two tank battalion, number seven artillery depot, and to all units of Siberian expeditionary forces. Um, and some of our Canadians uh, were there even up until 1919. So we had units there in 1919. And then um, for Operation Russia, disbanded by General Order 191 of 1st November 1920. And this is the symbol of the Royal Canadian Artillery, including the 89 Field Battery here in Woodstock today. Ubik means everywhere. Ubik means everywhere. And that's, uh, I think, um, so a little bit of history on that. Um, the regimental mottos, of course. Uh, in 1832, His Majesty King William IV granted the Royal Regiment of Artillery the right to wear on their uh, appointments the Royal Arms and Supporters over a cannon with the motto, Ubik Krofas et Gloria de Hood. Uh, de Hood. Uh, everywhere, whether right and glory lead. That's what it means. The next year, in 1833, the order was admitted to make clear that Ubik and Chris Fest et uh, Gloria de Kunt uh, were two separate mottos. The word Ubik takes the place of all past and future battle honors in recognition of the artillery's widespread service in all battles and campaigns. Both the motto and Ubik may be born on regimental appointments. So the Royal Can Regiment of our Canadian Artillery was authorized to wear on its appointments Griffiths et Gloria de Kuhn and Ubik by His Majesty King George V on the 5th of August 1926. Usage of Ubik was confirmed by the Chief of Defense Staff on 11th of May 1994. Rather, um, so that's the, as you can see, that's the Royal Arms of uh, Royal Canadian Artillery here. And of course, um, that is a bit of history of the motto. The 65th uh, Depot Battery, 65th um, Overseas Battery, based in Woodstock. Now, we're going to talk about like the, the 10th. Woodstock Field Battery, which isn't today considered the A9 Field Battery, and of course that regiment uh, that it's under, Third Field Regiment, which is the oldest uh, regiment in Canada as far as artillery. Um, so the regiment was put. This regiment, uh, Third Field Regiment, was placed on active duty during the Great War, 1914-1918. Over 2,000 gunners were sent overseas, including the Fourth and Sixth Siege Batteries the second divisional ammunition column and reinforcement drafts of the ninth siege battery the first canadian killed during this war was captain ernest jones who died on august 5th 1914 while serving with a british regiment captain jones had served with the regiment in the 1890s as had two brothers um, one of whom commanded the regiment of course in the second world war um 1939, the regiment uh, manned coast and anti-aircraft defenses in St. John. Fort Mispec was uh, the heavy counter-bombardment battery for F Fortress St. John, with Partridge Island serving as both counter-bombardment and as the examination battery. Colonel J. Gilhart, former commanding officer, was Fortress commander. So the annual summer training took the regiment to Fort Dufferin, Petawawa, Camp Utopia, and picked in Ontario from the 1900s to the 1950s. Gunners trained at uh, Tracadie and on Woodstock Island, uh, New Brunswick during Second World War. Now Carlton York trained there. We're talking about Island Park and Woodstock, which is in the connection between its what 28 hectares. I'm trying to remember that the it's right in the connection between uh, Medjugorje River and Saint John River, where they meet. We're kind of where MB, near where MBCC is. Um, so we had a lot of units trained there, including uh, 89 Field Battery, uh, you know, of course, a different. Uh, and it was also, of course, where Old Homewick used to be, 
uh, in different, like the theme parks and whatnot. That's part of Woodstock's history. Um, of course, when Mactaquac Dam went in, Mactaquac Dam went in and it was flooded by what, two to, I don't know, like six feet of water, something like that. Um, and anyway, there, there's, there's little, there's some little stuff left there. You can go at low tide, but there's not, not that much. I mean, uh, it's, um, Island, so if I'm remembering, I'm trying to remember all the facts correctly for Island Park. Yeah, um, so, uh, so the, for the Great War, now, this is, uh, I got some of this from the Loyal Company Association, um, <clears throat> website so that's third field regiment's website now i know a lot of the guys at third field regiment because they're in woodstock 89 field battery and i've been to numerous events um they just had their 225th uh, anniversary a couple of years ago and i built them a c uh, no lg1 howitzer model for the um for the battery um so third field regiment consists of uh, that would be 89 fuel battery and then 115th battery in St. John. That's today. Um, so a little bit about the Great War I wanted to cover um, with them is, so the day after the war broke out in August 1914, the regiment barged its um, 4.7 inch heavy guns to Partridge Island to protect the mouth of St. John Harbor for the duration of the war. Um, the regiment stood on guard against uh, the very real threat of German cruisers and submarines on Canada's east coast. So they were there in even in the First World War, even though they had guys there and from Woodstock area that were part of 4th and 6th siege batteries and uh, around everywhere. Um, <clears throat> the unit's heavy guns uh, and experienced artillerymen also served to train thousands of volunteers from New Brunswick and eastern Canada for service in the Canadian Corps Heavy Artillery formed in 1916 in France and that's where a lot of those guys ended up going to um, the the Canadian Artillery, uh, the Canadian Corps, at, even up, going up through to Vimy Ridge. Um, <clears throat> so the regiment also contributed personnel to the 2nd Divisional uh, Ammunition Column and the 1st Canadian Heavy Battery, among them future commanding officers Lieutenant Colonel Harry Harrison and Major Cyrus Inches. Cyrus Inches being one of our local um, crew here, my belief. Um, <clears throat> so here you have a QF 18 pounder. Um, now, of course, these were these have been in service since 1904 to 1945. So they were even used in the Second World War. I mean. Um, they call it the simply the 18 pounder gun. Now, of course, it was used First World War era and also formed the the Royal Field Artillery. It formed the backbone of the Royal Field Artillery and even Canadian artillery, of course, uh, during the war. And it was produced in mass in large numbers. Um, of course, used in the Brit in the British forces and Canadian theaters, all the main theaters uh, by the by our soldiers and their soldiers um, throughout the war, and by British troops in Russia even in 1919. Um, so it's an 84 millimeter gun, and the shell weight was uh, greater than those of the uh, equivalent field guns. Um, in French, the 75 millimeter and the German 7.7 .7 millimeter. Uh, guns, which we have one in Woodstock, which is the FK-96 newer ERT, um, the 15-pound shell. They call it the whiz-bang, that gun. Um, there's the FK-16 and FK-96, and it's a, um, and it's that equivalency of the QF-18 pounder. Um, so this gun was generally uh, horse-drawn until uh, mechanization like vehicles in the 1930s, right? So, I mean, um, these were used by the even the Australians, uh, even the, the Russian Empire, um, Finland and Estonia, and used, used even all through the Second World War as well. Um, it's, an, it's an effective gun. Um, so the designers, Armstrong, uh, Whiteworth, Vickers, Royal Arsenal. So, and these were produced even up through to the 1940, and used up until 1945. Over 10,000 
469 built Mark One and Twos. Um, they have a six-man crew. Uh, the shell weight is about so it's about 18 pounds. So it's about three pounds heavier than the German 7.7 millimeter, 7.7 millimeter. So it's a caliber is 3.3 inches. Uh, so 20 rate of fire is roughly it, it's amazing because uh, it's 20 rounds per minute max but sustained fire is four rounds per minute that's it's, of course it's sustained um effective firing range is 6525 yards as, as they say um different variants uh mark threes fours fives different variants have over 10,000 meter effective firing range it's stream, stream, streamlined high explosive shells so um that's just some of the what the 18 pounder is uh is capable of and what it uses and um so in nineteen sixteen volunteers from the regiment traveled overseas as fourth and sixth Canadian siege batteries, firing their first shots in anger during the Battle of the Somme. Uh there there they perfected new techniques uh, of long range counter battery bombardment. The Canadian Corps of Heavy Artillery, including the 4th and 6th uh, Siege Batteries, gathered together for the first time with the whole of the Canadian Corps in the spring of 1917. That April, they fired what has gone down in history as one of the most successful counter-battery bombardments in history, neutralizing over 80% of the German artillery and paving the way for Canadian infantrymen to take Vimy Ridge. And that is what we call the Creeping Barrage. So you're firing a whole volley of a bombardment up a hill, and you're you're pinning the Germans down. You're taking out um, uh, their artillery, and you're pinning them down in the bunkers, in in the trenches, up the hill, and behind that, you have our Canadian infantry uh, pushing up the line. One, you know, um, one. Units one, two, three, and four. You know, um, um, and of course, as they adjust fire and push up, and they and they continue to fire up the hill into. Uh, so they hit one area for a while, then they continue to push up. As they push up the those that hill, they um, the troops will come in behind and take those areas that were just bombarded. So from Vimy, the 4th and 6th Canadian Siege Batteries supported the Corps in the difficult fighting of Pat for Passchendaele. Um, that's from Vimy for Passchendaele and in the final 100 days of the campaign. New Brunswick's batteries played an, an essentially important role in the, the dramatic Canadian victory at the uh, Canal, de Lo Canal de Nord and Cambrai in September 1918. At the end of the Great War, surviving veterans came home to what became known as the 3rd New Brunswick Coast Brigade, Royal Canadian Artillery, the Loyal Company of Artillery, in what's today known as 3rd Field Regiment, or the Loyal Company. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at the book launch in Woodstock. Uh, the uh, Greg Center, um, Lee Windsor, Mark Milner, um, at the Greg Center for War and Society had launched a book called The Loyal Gunners. And the Loyal Gunners um, were, uh, of course, that this is the history from uh, back from the, the 1700s up into modern day. Um, so amazing, uh, definitely. Um, and it talks about this. Um, so many veterans stayed active in the interwar militia, keeping alive the specialized skill set of long-range artillery. <clears throat> so this is just a, uh, it's an enlistment paper, um, as, uh, attestation paper from the uh, 65th Deepwood Battery. So um, back home, of course, uh, Camp Sussex was established as the first training depot battalion during the First World War. This tended camp was under the command of Lieutenant Colonel James uh, McCavity, 
during Second World War, Camp Sussex was again used to train those leaving for overseas service. So a lot of the guys, um, you know, from uh, Carlton, York, uh, you know, or, well, First World War, sorry, 26th Battalion, what would be 26th Battalion, all those units, including uh, what in Woodstock, what is now considered A9 Field Battery, the 10th Woodstock Field Battery. Um, so... The Woodstock, New Brunswick battery of garrison artillery authorized and was authorized in May 30th, 1866, became number five battery Woodstock um, of New Brunswick Brigade of Garrison Artillery in the 28th of May, 1869. Um, so detached, um, <clears throat> it was detached, converted and redesignated as the Woodstock Field Battery, and that was in uh, 22nd of May 1874, redesignated as the number 10th Woodstock Field Battery, January 1895. Um, the 10th Field, uh, Wood, the 10th Woodstock Field Battery, on the 20th of December 1895. So they've changed the name, um, so numerous, numerous times. And it was allocated to the 4th Brigade uh, CFA on 9th May 1905. And of course, designated as 89th Woodstock Battery CFA, 12th Brigade CFA, uh, 2nd February 1920. And so that's it. That's where the battery it traces its lineage from. And, uh, and, and eventually it becomes part, you know, of course, it, as it becomes part of... Um, <clears throat> Third Field Regiment, and of course, 65th Battery in Woodstock is an independent, and then so 89th Battery can trace its history back to 1840 when a volunteer unit was established in Woodstock. I mean, now some reports say even so that says 1840, so another report says 1866, but it was not until uh, 30th of May 1866 that the Woodstock Battery of Garrison Artillery was officially authorized officially authorized in 1869 the battery was recognized as number five battery New Brunswick Brigade of our Garrison Artillery now the third field regiment the Loyal Company and so that's just a bit of history of what our units here artillery came from and uh, so I want to, uh, for first for a war and whatnot, I want to touch back on the lineage a bit, and then bring us forward to the first world war. So mentioning here, it's similar stuff that I've mentioned. 1874, the Carlton County Gunners were detached from the wood from the NB Gar uh, Brigade of Garrison Artillery and redesignated the Woodstock Field Battery. It was at the this time that F H J uh, Dibble joined the unit. Eventually rising to the rank of colonel in command and command of the battery 1894 the unit became number 10th field battery <clears throat> well, in 94 95 so um different notes say different uh, differ the year but maybe by one year um <clears throat> by different canadian forces records say may differ by one year or two but usually just one or even maybe even a few months, so just depending on the authorization of the uh, founding of the unit, um, diff of different units in general. I mean, at this time, the battery had on strength one colonel, one captain, one lieutenant, and one second lieutenant, one surgeon, one veterinary surgeon, one sergeant major, one quartermaster sergeant, four sergeants, one trumpeter, four corporals, four bombardiers, one ferret sergeant, one collar mark, one collar maker, seventy nine rank and file. So that's and then twenty nine horses and four muzzle loading nine pounders. At the end of the nineteenth century, Canada sent E Battery Royal Canadian Artillery to the Boer War, and uh, eighteen men from Woodstock volunteered, including Captain William C. Good of Jacksonville. William Good. These men were the first members of the battery to serve in combat. Not too far from Jacksontown. That's great. In 1905, the battery, now under the command of William Good, was allocated to the 4th Brigade of Field Artillery. Brigade headquarters was in Woodstock. And as far as I know, uh, 
56 overseas battery that was a battery that was independent in Woodstock is what I've read until 1918 a few pictures here I'm not sure who that is at the moment I know I have something on him somewhere this is the 89 fuel battery here this is 1930 so that's not during the war but that's afterward I'd like to get some more pictures even for the museum of the guys actually you know in the first world war in the training Canadian soldiers returning from trenches during the Battle of the Somme now the Somme was an, uh, over a million a million to 1.2 million troops um, roughly 600,000 over 500,000 on each side on the German side and on our side died in this battle crazy war of a battle of attrition So a number of years, so uh, 2017, um, we had the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Now, I did a presentation on Vimy Ridge, but I will touch on it a get, bit again here. So, of course, uh, I talk, talked about the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Canadian Division. Um, and so, talked about our guys uh, and, of course, the, the heavy artillery in which uh, the 4th and 6th siege batteries were part of, I think it was the 2nd um, Division. <clears throat> so, talked a bit about, oh, did a, a large presentation on this here, and about Pimple, and then about each day, how it went forward for each division. So, the Battle of Vimy Ridge during the First World War is Canada's most celebrated military victory, and often uh, mythological, uh, mythologized symbol uh, of the birth of Canadian national pride and awareness. The four divisions of the Canadian Corps fighting together for the first time attacked the ridge from 9th to the 12th of April 1917 and captured it from the Canadian uh, from the German army. It was the largest territorial advance of any Allied force to that point in the war, but it would mean little to the outcome of the conflict. More than 10,500 Canadians were killed and wounded in the assault. I think it was 5,000, or sorry, 3,598, what I remembered, that were killed. Today, an iconic white memorial um, atop the ridge honors the 11,285 Canadians killed in France throughout the war who have no known graves. There are unknown, there are over so over eleven thousand so about eleven thousand two hundred eighty five Canadians killed in France throughout the war who do not have graves they're unknown amazing so Julian Bung first uh, Viscount Bung of Vimy talked a bit about him uh, in the uh, Vimy presentation I think. Um, here we have, of course, some of our guns here, and this is just so, showing some of the role of our artillery and um, our men bringing up round after round after round and firing down range, barrage after barrage. So the strength, we had, of course, four Canadian divisions and one British division, the totaling of, of this battle, uh, 170,000 men and three divisions totaling 30 to 45,000 men. So 3,598, over 7,000 wounded, unknown dead, unknown dead or wounded, 4,000 captured. So the African Canadians having a long proud history of serving in uniform from the days before Canada was even its own country to the current efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq. The sacrifices and achievements of African Canadians have shown through definitely that their struggle for acceptance and equality have been hard won. They preserved to make their mark, definitely. The First World War changed Europe's landscape, involving armies of men from around the globe. The war was largely fought to preserve European royal dynasties. Uh, instead, new orders shattered old 
uh, regimes, empires fell, boundaries moved, and the way in which people lived was revolutionized. Swept up in the excitement and patriotism um, that characterized the First World War, young blacks were eager to serve king and country by volunteering to serve in the conflict overseas. Prejudiced attitudes of many people in charge of military enlistment at the time made it very difficult for black men to join our Canadian forces. Hearing age-old lies about their inability to fight, African Canadians were told, this is a white man's war. You are not wanted or needed. And what? Uh, this is for the number two construction battalion for colored men of Canada. This is the number two construction battalion uh, of black Canadians serving overseas in the First World War. Just wanted to show you some of these pictures here from military moments. So we blacks did serve uh, an exceptional role in in the First World War and in the Second World War, in, in yes, in, in segregated units, but they proved their worth definitely. So uh, what I wanted to do in this presentation is show you um, what we what Canada did overall um, uh, to a large extent in in uh, the uh, First World War. Um, now the I'm gonna I can do some more on the Royal Canadian Navy, but what this main focus on was uh, the operation um, of local units um, in New Brunswick serving overseas and just basically putting out the knowledge of how many soldiers and what we contributed in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. And uh, so the number of men over there and the, the facts and figures of what we did overall uh, in the First World War. Um, <clears throat> but also coming from what I was doing is also doing that coming from a um, local standpoint as from Carlton County standpoint. And so here are some of the training aircraft, like the JN4 Jenny uh, training aircraft. Um, we used them for training pilots overseas. We had Royal Canadian Navy had helped guide, uh, much like in the Second World War, um, shipping all, uh, and convoys overseas during the uh, major battle of the Atlantic, the first battle of the Atlantic. And uh, so the escalation, the escalation, this is just some more footage of what had happened um, in 1916, 1917. So the sum. And <clears throat> so overall, the, the sacrifice that our men and women have made over there was absolutely immense even going up through into Russia, uh, through into 1919. And I'm going to touch more about that in further presentations about, uh, I'm going to talk more about uh, World War One weapons that were used. I'm going to talk about uh, what different uh, aspects of the war, different major battles and, and different contributing forces in later presentations. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Aaron Bulma, Military Specialist for Carlton County.